Uh, I just want to say I'm very pleased and honoured to be here. Uh, funnily enough, the older I get, the more nervous I get. Maybe it's because uh, we're a bit wiser as we're older and not so foolish about what we think we know and we don't know. Um, I'm going to talk today about a subject that has exercised me for a long time. In fact, I wrote an article in 1989 in the Sociological Review, which is called Love, Labour, Its Nature and Marginalisation. It was published, except the editors, which is very interesting, deleted the word love out of it, and they called it solid, solidary labour. And I was too young and too innocent at the time to resist, but I think it said a lot about the academy. And I have returned to it, uh, as Michael knows, I've worked a lot of my life and very devoted to education because I think, for me, education is freedom. Education is just so important. And I'll talk about that tomorrow. But I also think uh, I was very interested in why love was silent, and why love was silenced in the university. So <coughs> we started this research and empirical research in the 2000s. And at the moment, I'm involved in another research project. Uh, it's called uh, Working, Learning and Caring, which is actually empirical research. And it's on higher education. It's rather the site of our research. And in it, we're studying with about 10 higher education institutions. We've just completed over 100 interviews with people across these, across different areas of work, about the issue of working, learning and caring. I'm just saying, we haven't analyzed it yet, but that's the context out of which I speak at the moment. So I, I'd just like to just say what I'm doing now, I must put on my glasses because that's another disadvantage of getting older. Hold on. <laughs> I think they're here. I have them somewhere anyway. I left them down kindly a minute ago. I presume I have them. When one is nervous, you know, I said to them, definitely it's a sign of being nervous when you forget your glasses as well as everything else. I must have left them down here somewhere. How did I leave them now? No, no, no. I had them when I came here, so I have to have them. Sorry, I just, oh, here they are. I see them. I'm not that blind. <laughs> I'll let I'll, I'll so, you mind. So, um, I want to talk about uh, these issues. Um, why are they natural? Uh, the social systems, because this is something I'm working on at the moment with one of my PhD students who's just finished. It's the whole idea of the effective world as an independent social system. And the issue of how it intersects uh, and, and uh, the, that world intersects with other systems and creates a lot of injustices, or of course we can mitigate injustices as well. The neglect of this in the theories of justice, defining the parameters, and then I'm going to talk perhaps most about the concept of love labor and love relations today rather than solidarity. I say Michael mentioned I'm involved in another EU study of which is studying solidarity and activism and groups that have brought about change. And I could talk about that, but we're only in the middle of the fieldwork of that. So I don't really feel I have enough knowledge or expertise maybe at this stage to speak authoritatively on the concept of solidarity. And then why love matters, it's inalienability and why it matters for politics and social change and social justice. I suppose where my premise is starting here, that we are relational beings. I think that's so important. We are not cerebral, just of course. And, and I think we're tied effectively through relations of love, care and solidarity. And I'll define these in a moment. At one end of the continuum, and then of course there is abuse, neglect and violence at the other. But I think... <coughs> they play a very formative role in framing social action. In my view, the social sciences has largely neglected a lot of that domain of life. It has subsumed it into the entity of the family and kind of constituted it there and not dissected its dimensions and its complexity because, of course, it doesn't just apply within the domain of the family. And the other point, the reason I think it matters, is the normative dimension of values and dimensions of social relations are grounded in our dependencies and interdependencies. Because we become relationally engaged with others and through that we often develop our sense of responsibility and care and concern for others. So I'm saying if we have this disengagement from the effect of other centered actions which actually do motivate people, and we found that in the studies we did for the Effective Equality book, 
are not just self-referential. Of course, there is self-reference in all human action, but they are not entirely so. And I think because we have not engaged with this domain and we have not engaged in the subject of love and in the subject of care, we have actually disempowered our scholarship in this unethical era of neoliberal capitalism. I also think that while I firmly believe and have been an activist on class issues all my life and on gender issues, that only dealing with these major axes of injustice, the Marxist variant trilogy of class, status and power, confuse the fact that not all interests are, not all actions are interest-led. Of course, there are to some degree, I'm not denying that, but they are not exclusively so. Indeed, I would argue that the world would disintegrate if all action were interest-led in the sense that maybe perhaps that Harry Becker talks about. So, what I'm saying here, they exercise the effective relation, this domain of life exercise the same structured role in relation to our relational life, care, love, care and solidarity do, that economic relations, for example, exercise in relation to material life. And that the concept of effective equality integrates the concept of dependency and interdependency into our understanding of equality and human rights and citizenship. Can I give a practical example of the second point? I was very involved, although I'm, in, I'm not a, um, I am heterosexual, I was very involved in writing about uh, the equality issues around uh, LGBT rights, around the marriage equality campaign in Ireland. And the fact that we wrote, in fact we first gave a presentation on effective equality in a government meeting of all places in, in 2002 about the rights of people to be loved and cared for. And although those terms weren't always used, the right to love, it was called love equality, became a huge dimension of that debate in fighting for LGBT rights, because people had a right to be loved and cared for regardless of their sexuality. And I think they have profound implications for other injustices, because I do a lot of work with the prisons and I'm very involved in work involved the prison rights, although prisons in Ireland aren't as bad, I think, I hope, anyway, as they are here. But at the same time, I think there are huge care and justice issues for people who are incarcerated. And it's a very serious human deprivation. We often think of prison or incarceration as a deprivation of freedom. But of course, the huge deprivation is the deprivation of intimacy and attachment and relationships. So I think, and of course, class-based injustices influence and interact and really impact on people's ability to care for one another. So I'm just saying it's deeply gendered, of course, it's raced and it's classed. I'll come back to that. So in our original work, and I just mentioned it here in passing for those of you who may have heard of it before, we identified what we call the major four social systems and more, four major dimensions of justice. They, they're mostly very familiar to people in the social sciences, the economic system, and the resolution being redis redistribution. I often say it's not just redistribution, it's just distribution in the first instance. Um, the cultural system, where the resolution is respect and recognition, whereas we are talking about the cultural institutions of the media, education, religion, art, um, um, you know, the music, literature, all of which, of course, create symbolic representations and can be the site or generation of injustice in the images and text and music and film, etc. So, and often here we center around the debates around identity politics and respecting differences and the political system, which is the right to parity of participation. And, of course, that's very important, not just in formal politics, but in the everyday politics of families, work organizations, student union, NGOs, everywhere else. But there, we would argue that there is a fourth system, the affective system, which is concerned with relational justice, and which is equality in having access to love, care, and solidarity, and equal sharing of the burdens and benefits of love, care, and solidarity work. So those, I suppose, would be how we represent them there. Uh, the four R's, we sometimes talk about them now. Uh, the resource, respect and recognition, representation and relation. And of course, they intersect. Because if you take the economic, you know, there is the old adage, if when hunger comes in the door, love runs out the window. And of course, that is true. Because if you're poor, you have to work two jobs maybe, you have less time to care, you have less money, 
You have less resources. If you need a break or you need respite, you don't have those resources. Or, of course, equally in the political system, if you're a child, you are, in most states and in most contexts, you are relatively powerless. You are not always able to determine the conditions of your own economic well-being. You're not able to condemn the conditions of care. They all intersect with one another and all interact within themselves. And equally, of course, if you're not loved and cared for, uh, you have, in a sense, always to live with that deprivation. And it is something that can affect you and your ability to form relationships. I don't quote them here, but there's extensive literature here, for example, in Ireland now, for especially from the children who were institutionalized in care homes and abused, about the impact that that had on their relationships and the rest of their lives. So these are all intersecting systems. I think for me, certainly, the, this literature, I have come to it, I know that people have written lately, like um, Michael Hart and Nick have written about love and it's political, but I think the people who I have been most influenced by have been feminist scholars, who have, especially the care feminists, who have taken the issues of love and care out of the privatised world of the family and uh, into the public domain. And I think what they've done is to challenge the separatist view of the person which is the core premise, I think, of con contractual models of social relations that inform the dominant theories of justice. Namely, that somebody is autonomous, self-interested, and concerned. And as I would see it here, there has been a major neglect of our affective selves, our emotional selves, as relational beings. Because even if you look at education, it, no more than, indeed, theories of justice, it is dominated by Cartesian rationalism. I always found it very interesting that Bloom's taxonomy of education objectives, the cognitive domain, were, of course, very well developed, but the affective domain never received the same recognition or notoriety. And this is a view of the homo sapiens rather than homo sentients. And the autonomous view, the idealization of a human autonomy, of course autonomy is very important, but autonomy is always aligned with our human vulnerability, our physical, our mental, and our emotional vulnerability as human beings. And the, I suppose the assumption is well often that people are non-relational in making decisions. And certainly, the current research we're doing shows very clearly that when people make decisions about their lives and their careers or their work, they always do so in the context of their relationality. And yes, their self-referential power status and money matters, but they are not only that. They are also often very much other-centered, depending on their relational commitments. So the other point here is that the citizen is not just a public adult citizen. The way people talk about the citizen or this member of society, as if this was the only person, the citizen who can enter contract, the citizen who's cognizant and who's mentally capable, but people are members of society, and I know that the concept of the word citizen is problematic in itself, given part of the deprivation of citizenship for so many people. But if we take it, the member of society is not just an adult citizen. So what I'm saying here is that effective equality is a challenge to mainstream liberal theories of justice, because it recognizes the relational character of people, it recognizes their vulnerability, it recognizes people as sentient beings, and that we are carers and care recipients, not just in the private domain of life, but in the public domain. And if you take the world of work, for example, one of the things that has been completely eviscerated from a lot of our working lives is the whole culture of care or concern to others. It has been reduced to you know, human relations, human resource management, and that is what we have become. Not colleagues, not workers together, but human resources, forms of human capital which actually uh, denies the fact that we are also sentient relational beings who can and do form friendships, for example, with people with whom we work. So I think that this relationality brings a normative dimension to decision making. And it is often drives what people to decisions and things that they do. So I'm saying here that effective equalities occur, I suppose, in a number of ways, but certainly when you're deprived of these three areas, you to survive and develop, and when the burdens of, uh, because of love and care and solidarity work are unequally distributed, as they are globally, especially between women and men, but of course they're also highly racialized 
uh, as we see with the migrant labour, for example, in Italy alone, there's 1.2 million people who are working as home carers, the majority of whom are Filipino. Often they leave their own families to care for other people's vulnerable, mostly elderly, but sometimes children. We see it all over Europe now as people migrate from the poorer countries of the East to actually care. In our case, they are white and they are Western, but in many cases, of course, there is a racial dimension to it in terms of color. So what I'm saying is we, we trivialize it. We don't teach it, as a, we don't think it's important to learn. I find it amazing. You learn how to cook. You learn how to do so many things in the school, but we never learn what it is in a formal way, not in our system, maybe you do here, and to actually love and care for each other. We actually don't know how to do it often, how to do it, and what even is required to do it. And it's also trivialized, because when you bring issues of love up in public debate, people go, oh, that's sentimental nonsense. But I often say that love is the assumed food of, a of emotional life. It's like money. When you have it, you don't think that it matters. So how this is how we, I represented originally, is like saying that we live in, uh, Carl Higgins spoke originally again about nested dependencies, and maybe this is some way an adaptation and development of that idea, but that we live in this in small world of primary, face-to-face, -face, intimate relationships, uh, in the secondary care area, in areas of work, I'm going to find them in a minute, and in the tertiary care sphere, because if you take care as solidarity, uh, what I'm saying here, primary relations are our love relations. They're the ones where there's high interdependency, greatest attachment, intimacy, and responsibility. And they're chosen, or sometimes they're assigned to us, assigned to us through having our parents who become dependent, or brothers and sisters who become ill or seriously, maybe perhaps somebody who's seriously intellectually disabled and needs care, were many ways in which our dependencies and interdependencies form. But to create and maintain those, one of the major points I have made and we, we make in our work, with us in uh, the other people who are working with me now, John Baker and others who have written on with me on this, Sarah uh, Cantillon, is that of course it, it is work. And I think that is the great myth in life, there is no work in this area. But statements of concern for others are, are just empty rhetoric unless they're translated into action. And secondary care relations are very important, and of course one can mutate to the other, but they involve care and attachments that don't carry the same depth of moral obligation or meeting dependency needs, especially long term, but they remain very salient in neighborhoods and in local communities where people work and maybe support one another, where people form community groups, where they involve in our employment situation. And of course, there are many informal networks that we have of friendship, which are hugely significant in people's lives, which are not necessarily tied to families. And then I would argue that there is the tertiary care sphere, the public sphere of the state, but also the global sphere of solidarity. And here, it is the political form of love. This is where we don't have intimate relationships, but where we enter into, sometimes, for example, through the welfare state. It was a form of solidarity. And what I see now in Europe, of course, is a major attempt to break up that level and limited solidarity that we had. It's an attempt to dismantle it, of course, and to commercialize many of the services which we've provided through public funds for one another in a public space. And even if we take people's work like that of um, um, the spirit level, Wilkinson and Pickett, it's very clear that societies that show solidarity have better health, better well-being, better well-being for children, or less violent. So solidarity have, and care and love have very real outcomes. So what I'm saying here, they matter for survival. I think that I'm amazed always when people talk about the materiality of life and economic relations. There is nothing more material than the human body. We will die in infancy uh, without being cared for. We will die when we become old, and if we live long enough to be dependent without care, we die when we're ill without care. So survival depends on it. And human flourishing depends on it, because much of what gives joy and fun and meaning to life for an awful lot of people is, in fact, the presence and being with others being in their presence and being enabled to do things with them. 
So what I'm saying is that love, care, and solidarity are productive. They're really material things. They are not ephemeral, they're not trivial. And they have very real outcomes because the lack of them produces the negative outcomes of a fear, a sense of being unloved and unwanted, anxiety, and of course it escalates up into the public sphere where we have poor health or you only get health care provided you've got money. So I'm saying it involves work. It's physical work, mental work, emotional work, attentiveness, and in various degrees depending on which sphere of work we're talking about. But it takes time, energy, and it's both a burden and a pleasure. And also, of course, it's stressful because that we are always judged, especially as women, you're judged whether or not you're a good mother or a good daughter or a good sister in a way that is very intimate in how you're actually judged in your intimate work. And it's stressful and it involves conflict because there's always conflict between your political, your own career interest and your care interest, between what you contribute to the level of solidarity at the level of the state and what you contribute to your own economic self-interest. It involves conflict. So I'm saying it plays, why well, I mentioned love in particular and why it matters. Because I think it produces us as intimately capable people. People who are human, are humans, and are humanists in the relational sense. And I would argue very strongly that without nurturing, without being nurtured, it's very hard for people to sustain themselves in life. Very hard, to, and yet we treat this as if this was a pre-given entity, as if it just happened. And it's a public good, because without it, life is significantly less than it has the capacity to be. Not to say that people don't survive, they do survive. But the quality of life, and the meaning of life, and the purpose of life is enriched by, in fact, having care and love around you, both in the political sense and in the um, secondary sense through care institutions and in the intimate spheres of life. And I suppose, but I would argue that love in particular is distinguishable from other forms and analytically, and especially because it's non-substitutable. And I think this is a huge issue for um, our society and for the world, because as women have entered the labor force, and um, rightly so, now in recent history, they've always been there, but maybe in a more formal way, uh, nobody has recognized the fact that all this unpaid work went on and who is going to do it? Because, as I say here, there is an inalienability. You can't um, pay someone to go out to dinner with your partner and pretend it's yourself. You can't pay somebody to go and visit your mother or your father in hospital and pretend it is yourself. It is non-substitutable. And because it's in generated in the intentions and feelings, it can't be bought and sold. Everybody says everything is commodifiable. I would argue that this area of life is not commodifiable. You can pay someone to mind somebody, but you can't pay someone to love them because it is based on intentions and feelings that can't be traded. And they're voluntary and they're person-centered and they're person-specific. And the problem is that in the love relations, the person doing the caring is inseparable from the caregiver. So you can't substitute and find someone else. And it involves presence, so you can't segment it into pieces and, you, and be there and be somewhere else at the same time. It's not humanly possible. I think this whole debate about you know, the ability to care, we can't be moved. We are spatially bounded. We're bodies. We live in bodies. And we can't be moved simply by somebody wishing us to be somewhere else or be partially present to somebody. And so what I'm saying is that love can't labor in, in this work that we involve with one another can't be assigned without altering the very nature of the relationship into something that it's not. And the other point I make here is that the logics are very different. The logic of love and care is a very different type of logic. It is a different uh, temporal logic, different concept of time. Uh, it can't be done in measurable time. Because its nurturing needs dictate the time frames, not the economy or policy logics. So it's no use, and this we see it happening with, I'm doing research as well, I should say, with the Professor of Palliative Care. And one of the areas we're researching is the quality of care given to older people, and mostly older people we're looking at at the moment, who are in care, and this idea of time on task. Of 
course, is completely anathema to the idea of care. Because the old person, and I speak as somebody of Michael knows, my mother is the great age of 104. I spoke to her earlier on today. And today, she's 104. She wants porridge when she's hungry. She doesn't want it at 5 o'clock or 7 o'clock or when she lives in her own home. When people are vulnerable, they need care when they need it, not when the policy dictates that they have it. So it's also not infinitely condensable. I think one of the great myths is you can do it in less and less time. You know, the McDonaldization of it, you can have fast care like you have fast food. Well, you can't because if you can't give it in standardized packages, as Nancy Forber and others have pointed out, uh, to do so is a kind of fine care often leads to pre-packaged units of supervision. Um, that's what you get because you, you, you put it into a different logic, whereas the logic of care is, is very different type of logic. And also it's dictated by needs. And of course, there's a sense in which we could never have enough care and there ha we have to grow human, therefore there is a boundary on it. But in a sense, it has no clear boundaries. It's always open to negotiation, to effort, to investment. And of course, for that reason, it's a major site of conflict and stress and anxiety, especially where people have young children and you're working. I used to often say, even people talk to people now, they'll often say to an interview, people of young children, they say, when I'm at work, I feel I should be at home, and when I'm at home, I feel I should be at work. They're always there. There's their care map that people carry, women disproportionately around in their heads. And the rationality of caring is very different. It contradicts um, economic rationality, bureaucratic rationality. There's no hierarchy, there's no career structure, uh, there can't be supplied to order, and there's no beginning, middle, and end. It's not clearly defined. So in that sense, I think that it needs to be dissected as a sphere and examined for what it is in itself. I'm not saying that the primary care doesn't intersect, it most certainly does. There's quite a lot of research showing, for example, that people who are nannies, especially over a long period of time, often have, for various reasons, better relations with the children that they care for, maybe even that they have, the parents have. So, of course, relations mutate between one and the other. I'm not saying that there are nice, neat boundaries between these. Or, and of course, outer circles of caring friends and neighbours can enter the intimate sphere and become. But in general, these if, you, if your friend in your job is going to leave and you'll miss them, you will not feel that they have made an immoral choice, an unjust choice, if they decide to go somewhere else. It's a different level of commitment and a different level of dependency and interdependency. And I would say professional caring can mutate and it can change and it's very important as a supplement and a very complement to what we would call love labor. So I think as well that, just referring here to Joan Bronto's, Tonto's book, Caring Democracy, she makes, I think, a very important point in it, which is democracy is a neutral. It's about something. What is it about? What is democracy about? And our argument is that it should be about creating a caring world order. And I think that's a very interesting point of view because it's about taking not the rights discourse, and of course it's very important where we demand that people have human rights, but in our society and in many societies, getting gaining your rights is a very adversarial system and as a principle for justice. In order to vindicate your rights, you often have to engage in the law, you have to engage in adversarial claims, and in our case you're not allowed class action. <coughs> so often to unless you have the means to actually employ the legal services and the resources to do so, your life rights often go unclaimed. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't have those rights, we should. But <coughs> if we rely solely on contractual notions of justice generated around adversarial claims in human rights, then, of course, there is no wider ethic governing human behavior. There's no wider frame or principle governing democracy. What is the point of democracy? Of course it's important that we have participation, but participation and equal participation for what? <coughs> and for me, I suppose, I think that care is not just a matter of mode of action. It's a disposition and it influences how we relate to one another and also to other living creatures and of course the environment. So 
So I would argue that it, there's an urgency about it, ethically, um, because it's a way of relating to attentiveness and responses and informing ourselves. Because once you start to inform yourself about how the other lives, and often we decide deliberately not to inform ourselves, then of course we enter into a world where we begin to know and understand the injustices of others. And that begins to influence how we frame our own questions about what we do ethically. And what I'm arguing for here, I suppose, is that uh, there's a huge problem at the moment, and has been for a very long time. You cannot get care into politics, because we have this ultimate contradiction that the urgency and imminence, especially of primary care work, but also of a lot of secondary caring, for example, in hospitals or with children in, who are, you know, in nurseries or whatever, or elder care, the very people who need their politics to enter the public domain are unable to go there. And that, I think, is a huge problem politically. And I don't know how to address it, but I certainly feel there needs to be a new form of politics created that would bring that into the public domain. So I would say the political concerns of many of the people of the world, the people who are in need of care, who are primary carers, those who have high dependency needs, uh, people who are incarcerated, people intellectually disabled, uh, are, are excluded often from political framing. Nancy Fraser talks a lot about the importance of political framing. How can you enter into parity of participation if you have no means to allow your subject of concern to enter the public domain for political framing in the first instance? And as far as I can see it, most theories of justice are a lot of the time are about regulating relations between strangers uh, around contractual relations and making sure we have universal principles. I don't doubt their importance. But the, those principles alone will not address the kind of justice issues that I'm raising here. And I, I see it happening in Europe, whereby as the issues of care are trivialized, especially with the cuts in the welfare state, there is an assumption that this work is going to happen. Even the inalienable work, somebody is going to do it somehow with no time and no resources. And that's humanly impossible in my view. And because I think, I, I just finish here, I suppose, what I'd say at the end is, I think, to sum up, because love, care, and solidarity matters, equality, effective equality matters, because there are burdens and benefits that need to be distributed equally around age, gender, um, class, and race, because it's highly gendered and raised. I think that's a huge problem in the doing of work, but also, the receiving of it and the, the care that we need, the time to care, the presence, to be in the presence of others, to recognize the time that that takes, and that that time is going to take from our materially productive time, although it is material in its own way, in the other more economically, perhaps even politically or culturally productive time. And there is a big conflict there to be resolved, because the love laboring is non-substitutable and inalienable and non-commodified. And uh, I just think that those who are uh, the inalienability, urgence, and imminence of it, that I said, limits those who are doing it and who are in need of it from entering the public domain. So I see those as some of the major dilemmas that we have to address. Thank you very much. So we have time for questions, comments. Is wonderful. Um, I actually have a, maybe two interrelated questions. Um, one is particular about your slide on uh, how love is inalienable. So I'm wondering, oh, inalienable. yeah, and like the uniqueness of love. So I'm wondering, is there like an extent to which love could be extended? So is love finite? And if it is, how far can it go? So I'm particularly wondering, if, say, for instance if we have a political form of love or in the sense of solidarity, usually we extend it only to like a particular community rather than to say, I love everybody. So then in that case, what obligations do we owe to those that we do not love? Um, and then the second question is, um, will there be a tension or conflict between the ethical and the political of care? So the ethics of care would say that um, 
we are obligated to perform care in this particular way, in the sense of being attentive and responsive, but then there's also the political structure that limits maybe the resources or ability for us to perform that. So how do we negotiate that tension? Your first question is about kind of where the, like what are the kind of, do we have responsibility? I would say that that's where you have the concept of solidarity. Mm -hmm. And I think solidarity is a very problematic concept. Rorty has written about it, many people have written about it. Because of course, sometimes you can have solidarity that is very much concerned and narcissistic, mm -hmm. And which of course you can create out groups and in groups. And I mean, there are huge issues, I mean, around where the boundaries lie. But I would say that that is where responsibility lies in terms of creating the conditions in society so other people have time to care. Creating the society in which people have time to do it. If you have work hours where people to survive have to have two or three jobs, and they have other, and they have desire to have not just have in the sense of obligation, but sometimes desire to have good relations with their partner or their friends or, their children or even their dog. They don't have time. And capitalism is greedy. And it has made life such, and we have made the conditions of employment so poor for many people, that they literally don't have time to care. And I don't know, I don't do research, but I would love to be doing research on all the illnesses that have developed around anorexia and bulimia and all those other illnesses that are developed around young people. Because I just wonder, is this about power of control, how to care, food, this fight over love, who has, you know, at least if they eat, it's time that you have fed them. So I think there is a whole conflict in our culture over time. So at the political level, I would see it as making those conditions, creating and fighting to maintain the welfare state. I'm involved in Michael Lowe's in a lot of fights around this. I do a lot of media work, I talk about the need to have publicly funded childcare, because unless we have those resources, people have no time. And unless we have a living wage, people have no time. Because then you are forced to actually in a state where you literally can't be present. So you said, is that answer your question, the first one? Yeah, so I'm also wondering is whether our kind of ethical responsibility to love is a boundary. So whether whether we can like kind of love, extend love and care to like infinitely, or whether there is like a limit. I think, so uh, absolutely. I think there is a limit. There's a human limit to what we can do. And I think, but I think it's a very interesting question to ask. Uh, we have had many, in my own experience, for example, I have two children of our own, and we have five nieces and nephews who have us over 16 years. Currently, have one of them. Uh, we have also my neighbor's son. And it is interesting because we had, we always used to joke, that's my partner, we had spare capacity. We had spare emotional capacity. Not everybody has spare emotional capacity. Uh, some people don't have spare emotional capacity, that's grand. But we have spare, we love. It is sometimes because we are lucky. There is an element of life, we have been loved. And I do think that people don't recognize the importance of, I'm not saying everybody does that, I'm not asking, I think I'm just giving you. So I do think there are boundaries. We're all emotionally limited. I'm not saying you could prescribe that for everybody, I think it would be crazy. But if we do have capacities and we never question the institution of, for example, of our children and say, maybe they have enough. Maybe they need to share that with others. Maybe the idea of communal living, which is, you know, the whole idea of sharing in the village to raise a child and all that, is so alien to our culture because we're so migratory. And I would love to write, I mean, I think refugee issues, for example, and asylum seekers, one of the enormous injustices that people have, apart from the violence and everything else, is that they lose their intimate others very often. They lose their family, they lose their neighbors, they lose their kin, they lose their community, they lose their familiar world, they lose everything that they know. And the emotional cost of that is absolutely enormous. And we don't talk about it. We don't talk about it as an injustice. So yes, I, w I do think, I don't know the answer. I don't know where the family applies, my honest answer to you, I don't know. But I think there are, because we're limited. But I think we all know as well, maybe we need to discuss when we have limits and where we're at the limit. And when we have 
spare capacity, as I call it. We have spare capacity sometimes. We think of that, oh, love is only something that's private and, you know, not to be discussed. But in fact, maybe it's reflected in our politics. For some people, that spare capacity goes into social movements. It goes into fighting for justice for NGOs or trade unions or wherever. You know, it has different manifestations. But I think that is very real politics of love and real politics of solidarity. You asked me another question in the counter report. Yeah. I'm curious about sort of where you see self-care fitting into these things and like self-care and self-love, yeah. um, especially with this idea of time and sort of like when do you know to take that time for yourself um, in addition to sort of <coughs> feel like justifying self-care is something that happens yeah. a lot more than having to justify care for others, right? Like we're expected to care for other people, but it's expected that we'll give up caring for ourselves in order to care for other people. So sort of where do you see self-care fit I into this? I think that's a very important point, absolutely. I mean, I've written about that somewhere else, but what to talk about today. I think self-care is absolutely, but it's a huge gender issue. There's an awful lot of the gender narrative traditionally was you just look after, look after, look after, and you know, as especially as a mother, and then you never looked after yourself. So I think that there is a question of self-care, and I would put that in relation to, we'll say, again, go back to how society and market capitalism works. It doesn't assume that you have time to care. Take academia. I mean, it assumes you work all the time. It assumes you don't have any life. I'll talk about it tomorrow. It does actually assume that. In many ways, it's a 24-7 culture. So it's, it's a self-abuse culture. I would call it as much of the avoidance of self-abuse, because if you've no time to rest, if you've no time to enjoy things, if you've no time to actually say, I can't do anymore. And of course, there are differences in human capacity and what people can do. But I'm talking about if we don't create the structural conditions, because this isn't just about individual choices. You know, what I would argue, and certainly what we're finding from our Field work to date, I haven't analyzed all the interviews, is isn't that people have become somehow morally corrupt or indifferent or uncaring in the 21st century. It isn't. It's just that the conditions of security have made life so insecure that many people have to do several jobs, have to lose many commitments, with no resources, no infrastructure of care in the state, no community care. So, of course, people reduce and become completely privatized. So I think you need to link the self-care to the structural issues of injustice around you know, community institutions, proper health care, proper services, public transport, so you can get from A to B that it doesn't cost you a fortune. You know, all those infrastructural elements are fundamental in order for you to be able to care for yourself. I agree with you. <laughs> Yeah, sorry, sorry. I hope I'll be able to hear you now, sorry. I'm interested in um, your discussion on the social systems, the four systems you uh, lay out, like economic, political, culture, and factual. So in the past, usually, like we understand the structure and agency, like structure about like economic, political, and culture things. And uh, you add uh, the affective system on that. I, I was wondering, just yesterday, um, several PhD students, you know, Professor Michael Apples, we gathered, we discussed uh, your work, you know, especially how um, affective dimensions, uh, affective equality uh, is related to their notion of agency. So we didn't get the answer <laughs> yesterday. So we want to ask you, how do you understand their agency? <coughs> its relationship with the affective system and uh, relationship with the cultural system, you know. So how, how can we position the agency in your <coughs> social system? Yes, I think it's a very good question. I uh, would have to think about it because I don't think we yes. have it thought through completely in how, you know, what I would say, I suppose, I always find the debate in sociology around agency and structure. It's almost like the chicken and egg debate that's never going to be resolved, you know? Because 
Well, of course, people have intentions to make choices. There, there is. Yet there is agency in that sense. I don't doubt that there is individual choice and agency in the relational system of life. But there are norms and there are practices and there are institutions and there are laws and there are regulations which also constrain and limit how you exercise that agency. And I think that a lot of the time that particular institution, people are actually blamed all the time individually as if they were solely agentic in its creation. You know, dysfunctional families, irresponsible lone parents or mothers particularly. All the blaming and naming that goes on assumes in fact that there's almost complete agency. You know, you're held responsible. I'm not saying that people don't make choices, they do, but it I always say is it's almost assumed to be entirely agentic rather than structural. It's almost assumed to be that it is an individual choice. Whereas I would see it, and this is only something we're working on, and I haven't just even developed it all yet. Uh, I think there is a system there because, because of its necessitous and its, its, its fundamental uh, uh, infrastructural influence on human existence. Uh, every society has some kind of system for caring, however it is. And of course, it varies culturally, it varies in terms of gender, everything, it varies in terms of history. But human beings will not survive and they won't grow and develop without being careful. That's a fact. Like, you can't eat without, you can't live without food. Like the old feminist adage, you know, bread and roses. You literally can't live without love. Not fulfilling, you can live a minimal life. And it's interesting in one of the chapters in Effective Ecology, I may not be answering you correctly now, but I suppose one of the chapters is about people, 35 or 40 people who were spent a long time abused in families and then in institutional care. And many of them talk about how they could not learn because they were loved. They were unable to learn. They couldn't, their minds, their preoccupations were with their own emotional insecurity. Now they are talking about extreme cases. I grant that. But I think there are many gradations of that. And in that sense, I think that there is a very important system there. How, how we find it, I'm not saying I know all the answers. I don't know all the answers. And I certainly don't think I'm answering you. When you ask me about agency, I ask you, what do you mean by agency? What does it mean? I'm never clear when people say there's agency. We wonder this question. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, of course there is agency, there is choice, there's... Uh, you know, we're not completely determined, but there are an awful lot of social institutions and political systems and economic systems and cultural systems there that infiltrate and influence how we do and how that system actually operates. But uh, I suppose it is very hard to imagine life without that, those in, without that, I would say that without that system. What kind of people would you have? What produces people? Sylvia Federici talks about in their humanness. How what produces us in our humanness? You know, we, we, we can be successful academically, we can be successful economically, we can be a failure in all those things. But many times people can live perfectly comfortable, happy lives without, provided they have enough to live. And I think sometimes we're made to feel as if uh, you, you know you have no right to be, just to be in the presence of those you're with, without earning a lot of money, without having a lot of status, without just living. And many traditional societies have those values. And that's why I think sometimes conflict, we say around, I did some work in, with women from uh, Jordan and Saudi and a number of countries there a few years ago. And I found it fascinating how they saw Western culture. And they saw it as quite primitive. Like primitive in care terms. When you look at it from the inside, if they saw, they saw it as quite primitive. You put your old people away into homes when they become a nuisance. It was a common kind. You know, uh, intellectually disabled people, or, you know, where do they belong? You know, how are they, how do, you know, there were a lot of questions, and I think because our society is so governed by, you know, the consumption and you know that's how capitalism drives us to consume all the time consume more consume more that makes you living you have more status 
But in fact, a lot of people, that is not the primary concern in life for a lot of the world. So whether that's agency or a system, I honestly don't know. And to be honest with you, at this stage of my life, I don't care. But I do know <laughs> that I know what matters to people. And I, that's why I wrote that time, love and care matters in both senses of the term. Did you want to ask me something? I think you mentioned that you have a question for me. First of all, thank you so much for coming to speak to us. Um, but I had, so I had a question about, uh, I'm trying to think of like what the um, the um, the goal is in terms of, well, in terms of getting uh, care and love more, you know, valued and nurtured and equally distributed um, across um, societies like, like US society. Um, I was wondering where for, for you um, gender fits into that picture. I mean, I, I know this is a big, question and you mentioned that um, the burden of care isn't, isn't distributed evenly by gender, but in terms of like the construction of care and love itself, like the gender construction of it, I mean, to what extent uh, does the gendering of, of care and love um, play into its sort of subordination in this system? And I mean, what, what can we do about it? <laughs> I think absolutely, of course it has played into it. Uh, but you know, what I'm trying to say is intellectually, I think we need to distinguish between the two. Care is not synonymous with gender, and gender is not synonymous with care. I think they're analytically separate. And that's what I think is very important, because sometimes all the work, it is an enormously gendered issue. Of course it is. It's women carry that responsibility in the world. But it is a myth to say that men can't do it. It's a complete myth. Men, and I, we have a joke at home in, as in, in my school in colleagues. Yeah, including with my male colleagues, well, we should, they often say, well, we actually, given the Irish mother and their preoccupation with their sons, we should be much better at nurturing, actually. So, you know, you can take off and go to work and we stay at home. But there is an element. Of, uh, the denial of the effective has an impact on men, of course, as well, at the personal level, because, of course, this is not assumed to be the vulnerability of the human, Martin Osborne talks about that, but the vulnerability of the human condition, not being autonomous. All of those are not seen to be uh, male-defined ways of being. Like Connell talks about masculinity equated with dominance. And it's true. I mean, certainly in our culture, one of my former PhD students published a book on it on men and masculinity and care in art and I'll handle it. Um, and it's true, they don't. To be a man is not to be a care. You can be a care, what he found is you could be a care and something else, a small farmer, or have another job. But to be that, and a young man, especially on your own doing that, is not to be male, to find, in the hegemonic sense of masculinity. And in that sense, I think it has enormous gender implications for men. And the whole issue of being allowed to pretend or to display the vulnerability of your human condition is not something that men will generally do in the presence of other men. They won't. Because to do so is a sign of weakness, which is a sign that you are not you know, a man in that traditional male-defined way. So I think to take this out into the politics of life, I think if there is a recognition of that for men, then I think, and if men begin to see that they are part of that narrative, then I think you have a different way of starting to frame politics rather than always to see this, that women must take this out into the public domain. It is not just an issue for women. It's an enormous issue for men. As a human beings, as then have the very same needs for affirmation and care and intimacy and affection as women have and children have. It's no different. But the way it's constructed, and women have done the work, there's no question about that. They still do. That is, you know, that you're, the, as I say, it's like the function on the computer. You're the default carer, you know. You change the font and you go back in and absolutely goes back to the original font. And the original font is equals woman does care work. So I think we have to get out of that because if we don't, uh, first of all, it's not realistic in the world that we're in because uh, of the way the distribution of work is and women in employment and everything else, but also because I think it is an enormous deprivation in men's own lives not to recognize that capability in themselves in, and to be able to recognize it in a public space, not just in the private space. So yes, I think it's an enormous gender. I wrote a paper actually, published in 2008, called The Gender Order of Caring. Yes, absolutely. Did 
Julie does. Yeah, I have a, I think it's a related question that you just answered some of it. Um, but I'm curious about, you know, people like Michael Hart talk about the rise in affective labor and sort of talk about it from a slightly different angle um, that it's, the economy is transitioning more towards certain, like a service economy requires people sell this, have sort of cultivate and sell certain dispositions. Maybe you'll talk about this more tomorrow in your in your talk. But I'm just kind of curious about how do we reckon how do we reckon with this move? You know, the, the, some of the biggest sec sectors of employment growth are in the service sectors. So how do we reconcile a simultaneously economic misrecognition of caring, but a rise in service work? And how can we how can we basically? I guess my question is. How do we value care work without devaluing it, which is a bit what's happening in this current moment. It seems yeah. like a, we're, in a, we're in a pitch, and I'm just curious if you have thoughts I on think that. The, I think they're analytically very distinguishable, even though the, there is a whole manipulation of emotion, mm -hmm. especially in organizations, you know, wearing your casuals on a Friday to make you feel at home. Mm -hmm. Google, I have been in Google and Dublin. It's marvelous, you know, you can stay there all day, they have food upstairs, you're very casual. <laughs> yeah, and you're working from morning till night. It is complete and utter commercial manipulation. And anyone who thinks otherwise is very naive. So I think that that is uh, the manipulation of emotions and, and the rise of the services sector. Uh, a part of that is of actually, if you like, commercializing a certain area of the affective. And if you know, I am not saying that everything that is affect constitutes care. I want to make that very clear. Sarah Ama talks about the role of affect in politics, mm -hmm. fear in particular. Mm -hmm. Of course, fear plays an enormous role in politics. Mm -hmm. So I am not speaking of that. I think analytically, emotions are all part of these, but they are separate spheres. Mm -hmm. and I, I think of what they say about the rise of the multitude and, you know, that we will all uh, kind of mobilize on the base. I just think it's politically very naive, sorry. As somebody who's been involved in a lot of mobilizations, I think that it is not going to happen. I think you have to mobilize at the grassroots and, you know, you have to organize and you have to build up campaigns. <laughs> you have to do an awful lot of practical organizing work mm -hmm. to create a campaign. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying that emotions don't play a part in it, of course they do, but I think that they're, they're quite separate spheres, the affect of politics, the, the you know, going back to um, <coughs> Arlie Hochschild, you know, the managed heart. I mean, that has always been there. There has always been an element of the service industry in America, particularly because when I worked in American hotel in Copenhagen one time as a chambermaid. I remember we had to smile every day. It wasn't natural, but we were supposed to smile and say, have a good day. You know, we were all told to do this. We used to make very cynical remarks about it. I'd have to say those of us who didn't come from that cultural tradition. But we were aware we were being manipulated. So I think that that is a very different form of the affective, and it is a domain. But I suppose what I'm talking about is the care relations. And I... I would see them analytically and conceptually as quite distinctive. Mm -hmm. That isn't to say that emotions don't matter in different spheres, as they do in politics, as they do in commerce. Mm -hmm. I'm specifically talking about the nurturing of other people mm -hmm. and the amount of time that it takes. It isn't just nurturing. <laughs> I don't know if any of you have seen the um, film. It's a film from the book that he wrote, Alan Bennett, um, The Lady with the Van. You know, the lady in the van. It is very funny. It's about somebody who's homeless, but about how she came to be part of his life. And, but in it, there is one line, which I think is very telling. And it says in it, he says in it, love is all about shit. Sorry, but that's exactly the line. And the reason I say that is because it is material. It is real. It is hands-on. It is a lot of of practical work. I almost think even about the romance of children when you're having a baby and everybody's going, oh, it's wonderful. And no one tells you, it's terrible. You can be awake all night. Can nobody tell you? Like, well, people get real and tell people the truth. You know, that is actually what it is. You won't have any sleep for six months. Of course, you'll be sleep deprived. You'll be exhausted. You better get all your friends, all the credits and everything. You better call them all in because you will have no time to yourself. So in that romanticizing, it's like the people, you know, 
what shall I say, the declutter, they certainly de-romanticise romantic love. Well, I think we need to do the same with things like, for example, small children and care for them. And this, it's a lot of work. I'm not saying it hasn't huge joy and dividends and everything else, but a lot of the time it doesn't. And a lot of the time it's work. And because we don't name it for what it is, I think we create all these silences then. You can't dare to say, well, actually, I'm at my wit's end. I can't bear the sight of that baby if I'm another and I sleep and I don't see and they're colic and I can't get up and that is the reality. So why do we romanticize it? You know, why don't we talk about it in a public way so that people can actually name it? And I'm not saying it has joy and there is the intimacy and everything else. Of course there is. There's also a lot of work. So I'm just distinguishing those factors from one another. And I don't agree when he says that uh, in one of the books he talks about is hard to take. We talk about us now this being immaterial. I don't think it's immaterial. I think that is absolutely not true. I think love in the practice of it and the doing caring is a very material thing. Uh, it involves physical work. If you're working with somebody who's elderly, it involves lifting them, it involves wiping their bottoms, it involves doing all the menial things that are part of life that we don't talk about. And that is the way you do them. As I said, somebody, when you love them, it isn't that you provide them with food. You provide them with their... I'll give you a laugh on this. Now, this is really an example of what I'm talking about. Last weekend, before last, I was with my mother. She loves porridge. Loves porridge. And I was gone out. I also have delivered two lambs. I'm very practical. Yeah. Hands-on farming. Um, it were a, a ewe, a as we call them, a lambing. And I delivered two lambs. And I came back in and John... My partner was inside and he gave a porridge. Now, porridge clearly wasn't up to standard. It was watery, it wasn't right, it was this and that. She came in and she said to me, well, that was the most dreadful porridge. <laughs> I don't know why you let it, you know. So I said, would you like another one? Yes, she said, I like proper porridge the way you do it. So there is that, you know. There is, this, it isn't just a matter of, I'm not saying he did it deliberately, he just didn't get the right recipe that she wanted it. But it is... It is that. It is about knowing you don't just provide somebody with something just for the sake of doing it. You provide it the way they want it, and you try to do it, and of course we don't achieve it all the time. In your block uh, economic system, if we were to take an old definition that I've forgotten where I found it, but came across it, it's how each society has to organize the production and reproduction of everyday life. Would that fit into your... Yes, of course. And I mean, I just think the reproduction is probably, it certainly is down here. The, uh, we have to reproduce ourselves. It's every day. We can't live without it. And the affective system, and why has it been taken out, is what I'm saying. Maybe it's because, it's somebody else, because women have tended to do a lot of that reproductive work. And I think the, the academy is a very... Um, it's a very masculine space, you know, it is a very masculine space even still and like I, I have to say, I find it even still, I go to academic council at this age of my life, I should feel completely at home, but it's still completely male dominated. So, and when you bring like issues like this, like care of staff, for example, up, there's a kind of side, like, what's this got to do with serious academic matters? Well, actually, it is a huge issue for academic matters, because if the staff aren't cared for, they won't be able to care for the students. But this is kind of like women's concerns, you know? This is trivial. But now, uh, I don't know if anybody's doing research here on health, but there is one of my colleagues in Trinity is doing a lot of research on uh, the health care, uh, the care of staff in the healthcare sector. And, of course, they're finding the obvious thing, that the staff themselves are not cared for, it adversely affects the quality of the care that they can give. So yes, reproduction, and of course the productive system, when we do do it. Of course the other institutions are there, the power and politics is everywhere, and the cultural institutions, but yes, I agree with you, I think the effective is primarily what we call the reproductive system. Thank you. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about autonomy. Um, I can't hear you. So autonomy. The concept of autonomy. So I understand that what you were saying is that it's problematic because it's it's premised on um, a rationality that really doesn't doesn't exist. Um, so I'm wondering what other concept could be used to to capture that idea 
without devolving into relativity. That, you know, if, if there isn't such a thing as autonomy, people or groups don't have a certain ability to decide for themselves, then what, what would be the relational term to refer better to that idea? I don't think there isn't such an entity as autonomy. I didn't mean to say that. I'm only saying that we are not completely autonomous. You know, and this idea that we can be completely autonomous, that we are, you know, self-sufficient, rational economic actors and govern our lives, I just think it is empirically incorrect because that is not the way the world is. We might like to think we are. We are presented with that as an ideal. I find it amazing if you look at little play schools and kindergarten now, you know, they have graduation ceremonies. They are just so absurd. <laughs> Hats on babies of two and three years of age. What are they saying? They're saying you should be independent. That's what they're saying. The message is loud and clear. You should be independent. You should, and of course there are good dependencies and negative dependencies. I would say the dependencies whereby many women in certain class of society did not happen, the majority of women in the post-war era who stayed at home, who belonged to the bourgeois kind of family and Freud wrote about, who were forced to be minding their children at home, I would say that was a very bad dependency, bad for women, bad for their children, bad for society. But there are inevitable dependencies. And there's an inevitable dependencies if we get ill, if when we have children, and we're interdependent. You know, uh, we, there was a Greek word, I think it's dualia, to care for the carers. You know, we, when we are in those situations, we need other people. And to display need now is almost like to, we've changed the language altogether, that even in our own culture, for example. And again, we followed England. I mean, it's pathetic the extent to which we do so. But anyhow, we always had social welfare, you had unemployment assistance and unemployment benefit. What it said was you were unemployed, and you needed assistance, or you had benefit because you had a job and you got pay-related social insurance. Now it's called what? Job seekers allowance. Job seekers allowance. So you are not allowed to be unemployed. You have to be a job seeker. So what that says is, even if there's no jobs, even if you are incapable, and there are people, I would have to say I've worked with many of them, I've worked for years with homeless people who were never going to get a job. It is an absurdity to pretend that they are job seekers. But what you're taking away is the idea that there are certain people at certain times for all kinds of reasons who are inevitably dependent. And I think that even the disability allowances now, I'm not saying the huge problem of care, and I know it's a very negative concept in the disability sector, and I know why, and the independent living movement, etc. But even people who I work with a number of years, who remember from a man who very close to has no arms and he doesn't have legs and he's a disability officer in one of the universities, and he would he can only move his head. He would say to me, "It is absurd to think that I could work five days a week. To get to work and to do work and to do my job properly, I can do it three days a week without it stressing me." But the assumption is, I must be now totally independent and you know work all this all the time, because there are inevitable dependencies. That's what I'm saying. And when we get very old, they are, we are. If we're unwell, we become dependent. And you know, a lot of you here are very young. Probabilities are you will spend two to three years at least of your life in high dependency, given life expectancy. Most of us don't want to think of that, but it is true. So I just think in that sense, we need to talk about that, because that's life. That is the human condition. Not, I'm not saying we're not autonomous, and I absolutely would fight for human rights and autonomy, of course, absolutely. But not to say that it is for everybody and at all times possible. I think, I, personally, I think it's, a, it's actually a really interesting point, and that's why I brought it up. I think that how to talk about that, how that relational aspect, but also negotiating if I may then take the chair prerogative, that's one question, and we'll pretend it's the last one. I realize that, again, we're, we actually normally go around. To, and that is what's been the response to your arguments. So let me give an example. Right now, 
There's the rediscovery of capital. It's a bit like the bell curve. It's a book that many people have bought, but no one will read it, and that's Piketty's book, which is the rediscovery of political economy without Marx. Um, but uh, you know, we are in a situation, um, we, uh, where there's been a forgetfulness of much of the arguments you're arguing against, which is that capital counts and the economic sphere is crucial. Uh, and so I can see parts of the left, another word that makes some of us nervous about what that excludes as well as includes. Um, saying, well, that's nice, but it's what you're arguing is you forgive these masculine words, but that's how we touch. It's sort of soft stuff. So it's a performance of masculinity. At the same time, though, it's something that has been forgotten. That is that capital does count. And it counts in powerful ways. And it actually is what is part of the argument that you're making. That is, it is destructive of bodies and emotions, etc. So what, what's been the argument, not of the people opposed to you usually, the right, but of the traditional left, or even some people who now call themselves neo-Marxists to see themselves. So people like me, uh, without, I hope, this argument against you. Um, so so, so what, what's been the well, I think people would say still this is soft talk. They would. But I think it's fundamental to capitalism. It's because capitalism is destroying life. It's destroying everyday life. You know, if you have insecure jobs, insecure housing, I mean, I'm engaged, as I said to my, in a big fight at the moment with the students in Ireland. We're starting a national campaign against fees. We have small fees, but they're trying to bring in loans over my dead body, and I literally mean we will fight up against loans. Because all it does is it ties people to debt. And what is debt? Debt is actually a payment from generally younger, not so well off, poorer people to rich people. Older. That's what debt is generally. You get loans, you pay back, you pay interest, and somebody makes money. And I absolutely think that what happens is that people then have all these debts. They have housing debt, they have credit card debt, and they have no time to care. They have no time because they owe so much. They have so many debts to pay. And I think that nobody, I think in that sense, it's intimately bound up with capitalism. And maybe, I, so that is one criticism. I'm sure a lot of people will say that. And they, you know, but I think it is so materially based because it destroys people's relationships and life and time and energy and it takes energy from you and even the enjoyment of life because if you don't have time to do it, if you have no support to do it, then it becomes a drudge and it becomes a misery and you become resentful. So I do think it's a very materialistic business. And so for materialists to reject the materiality of care is, I think, a bit ironic. At the right, they don't want to pay for care. They want to, uh, I, mean, I mean, absolutely. They don't want to pay for education, so they, why would they want to pay for care? But I think it is, in, certainly in political terms, there, probably culturally there would be a difference between Ireland and here. There would be a very strong value on the importance of care. It would be still a traditional society, maybe in the bad sense, but also in the good sense. People would see that your caring for one another would be very important, and that you would be... Mental illness, for example, has become a major national issue in the last election, and people would see that tied to increasing pressures of work, too much commuting, forced migration, forced emigration. Like I consider emigration, for example, a major injustice. Now, I gave a lecture on this, which is very interesting now that you mention it, in the west of Ireland on effective equality in a small hall in a, in a small village on the west of Ireland. It was full. It was full and it was about emigration as an effective inequality and emotional injustice. And the reason is because people knew they had lost their children. Their children had emigrated. This is only a few years ago in the recent recession. And they knew because they themselves had emigrated, or all their brothers and sisters had emigrated, another generation. And I do feel very strongly about migratory labor. Because migratory labor is central to capitalism. 
and migratory PhDs and migratory postdocs all over Europe. There's a special scheme to enable you to do what? Spend three years here and three years there. And, and for women, that's an enormous issue. Three, three year postdocs, you're in your late 30s. You know, it's a bit difficult and challenging to see starting then. Now, most people, women now in Ireland, are over 30 when they have their children. But I'm just saying there's a whole pressure and assumption. You can't have them. You can't have this life because you have so much to do and you have so much to produce. And, you have, and I think it's absolutely a problem, migration. Migration is never problematized in that way. But it deprives people often. Yes, I think it's great to migrate voluntarily. Wonderful. Completely different matter when it's forced. I think migration is wonderful. It's a wonderful opportunity to live in other cultures, to have the opportunity to learn. But when it becomes forced on you, I think it is a very, very different matter. And it assumes that your economic kind of well being is all that matters. And of course, economic well being matters, but it's not all that matters. And that's why I think we don't think capitalism, migration, and care for it. Refugees uh, and care, their imprisonment, incarceration, all of those which are very real issues and I think very tied to us.